Robbie D and the Lassenor. That's right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Robbie D and the Lesser Knowns. I'm your expert host, Robbie D. What am I an expert of, you're asking? Well, I'm an expert at bringing you the truth. As you know, this world is so full of useless information coming at you from every angle. It's nice to have your eardrums massaged by the gentle fingertips of the truth. With me, as always, is Northwestern graduate, producer Will. Don't! say anything just yet. For those of you who have been watching in the past, you know producer Will always sounds like he's in a fish tank 50 feet away from the microphone. Well, today that's not the case. He has his own microphone. So how are you doing, producer Will? Excellent. Thank you. Do it again. Excellent. Thank you. Well, we have nothing. Hello. Test. Hello, producer Will. Hello. Oh my God. That sounds phenomenal. Incredible. Oh, I'm excited. Okay, let's kill that, Mike. But moving on to the real purpose of the show, my guest today, piano player, trumpet player, five albums out. He was on that 70s show for a couple episodes, the five-hour energy guy, and he's fantastic as the Overstock.com guy. Oh, my goodness, those commercials are amazing. Also, his voice is the equivalent to taking that first delicious bite of a Taco Bell chalupa But for your ears, you're welcome, Taco Bell. Still don't have a sponsor. Let's say hello to Mr. Corey Landis. Hello. Thank you so much. Wow. It's a warm reception. Thank you. (laughs) It's very warm. Yes. We're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Yes. You look fantastic. Oh, thank you. So do you. You look like you just got off the links. I, uh, well, I may have, I may not have. That's for the viewers to figure out. Wearing, wearing some silly golf pants. They're not silly. No, not at all. They're, they're, no, they're great. These pants probably cost more than your car. That's probably true. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is probably true. Sadly. I don't know if that's sadder for me or for you. <laughs> no, it means I spent Corey a lot. Corey drives there. a cardboard Saturn. <laughs> I do. I do. No, that's very rude. These are expensive pants. All right? I like your pants. I, <laughs> they're great pants. <laughs> well, we're off to a great start. Mm. Corey... This show's not about my pants. This show's about your Well, well I've, I've been led astray then, <laughs> because I was told this was all pants all the time. As, 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 honestly, this could be its own two-hour podcast, but no, this show's not about the pants. This okay. show is about your journey to Hollywood, and I'm excited to hear about it. So let's just start from, where are you from? I am from a town called Worcester, Ohio, that is spelled with a double O, where the cows go muh. Worcester. Do not pronounce it Worcester. Why do they go muh? Because uh, most people say uh, Worcester. Worcester, but it, no. It's in Worcester, Worcester, the cows go muh. Oh. Um, it is a uh, small uh, small town about an hour south of Cleveland, farm country sort of area, about 30,000 people. Um, yeah, so I grew up there and um, then ended up going down to uh, Ohio University in Athens for college. And you majored in theater. I did. I started off um, hedging my bets, uh, and I thought I should get a more practical sort of education. So I started off in telecommunications for a couple years, um, thinking that maybe I was going to do television writing, television directing. I don't know. And so I did that for a couple years, uh, you know, did stuff at the radio station and... uh, and I started taking uh, non-major theater courses over in the uh, in the theater building, and I just felt a lot more comfortable over there. Uh, and so halfway through, I changed my major to theater. And the rest, and the is rest is her story. History. <laughs> you said you were a D. De- did you ever actually DJ? At the I did. Um, I did uh, the news uh, for the uh, the local. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, what, PBS affiliate, whatever they call it, uh, public radio. Um, I had a, I didn't DJ per se, but I had a sort of like an entertainment uh, recap show uh, as well. So I did those two things. Well, with the voice of gold, I could see you being phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is Corey Landis. This coming is Corey at you Landis guys. playing you all the hits. This one's from Sade. <laughs> Did the DJ Sira coming at you from <laughs> Wooster? Yeah, that's right. See, I already, I already messed it up. That's Wooster. Right. Whoop. Yeah. It's Worcester. It's Worcester. Get it right. God damn it. 
Let's get that microphone out of here. I mean, honestly, what were we, what were we thinking? <laughs> yeah, this was a waste of money. <laughs> you made a big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, that's phenomenal. I, I, I really would love to hear some old sound bites of you announcing. I still, I still have the tapes. Um, uh, one day, this was uh, why I was so glad that we uh, still have the tapes. Um, we were getting ready for the show and uh, getting in in the elevator to go up to the studio of ACRN, if anyone is listening there in Athens. And Mr. McFeely from the Mr. Rogers show gets into the elevator in full Mr. McFeely regalia. I don't know if you remember him, but he was the mailman. Mailman, yeah. Um, and uh, I was a, it was a, a bit surreal to just be riding in the elevator with Mr. McFeely. And he was there for some promotion or something for, you know, doing his PBS thing, I, I would assume. And, but we, uh, we snagged him for the show. We were like, we're, we're about to go on the air and we're doing this entertainment show. Would you, would you come up and just talk to us? So we got Mr. McFeely on the show. And I have the tape <laughs> of that still. So it was a good day. That's phenomenal. And then you realized... You were destined for more. Well, I mean, I, 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 everything kind of for me is definitely uh, about uh, feel. And um, I, uh, like I said, I, I was spending all my time in the, the TCOM building. And between, not, not that the people were bad or anything, but just between the, the, the folks there and the atmosphere, and it just didn't feel right for me. And so... Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I jumped ship and, um, uh, yeah, became a theater major. And I'm, it was a, obviously, a, it was a good decision. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Took that 70 all the way to the 15, all the way to the 10, all the way into... Something like that, <laughs> something yeah. Like I, that. Uh, basically, is, I, I graduated, uh, even though I switched majors halfway through, which should have prolonged my time there, I, I, I was... I was dying to leave. Uh, I was dying to get done. So I was able to sort of finagle uh, graduating on time. So I got out in in four years. And that fall, I moved out to Los Angeles right away. And let me guess. You move to L.A., you get there, you spend years toiling in the trenches, finding crappy jobs, and finally after about 10 years of being in Los Angeles, you find your finally find your way onto a television set. <laughs> uh Something like that, except for the uh, ten years part. Um, <laughs> definitely the crappy jobs. Um, no, I was uh, I was lucky enough to kind of have things happen pretty quickly right off the bat. Um, I from a job at uh, Gold's Gym Hollywood, a manager came in. No, what is this? No, a writer came in who was writing a really bad sketch show. Uh, he invited my then girlfriend and I to go to watch the taping of said show because I think he wanted to get in my ex-girlfriend's pants. And uh, did, he? did he? I would assume not. This was uh, an unattractive uh, man. This is what the show's about, though. Yeah, I, 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 I would just, I would say no. <laughs> but uh, at the at the taping of that show, the Joey McIntyre from New Kids on the Block was uh, was uh, on at the time. Uh, met a. Uh, manager there who had a soft spot for kids who just came to town. I think he knew somebody from Ohio or he was from Ohio, something like that. So there was that Ohio connection. He, he was a very sweet guy. And so he invited us to uh, come to his uh, office to essentially audition for him, just thinking he was, you know, kind of helping us out a little bit. And he ended up signing both of us. And then, um, and then I got an agent for, uh, from uh, uh, a connection of his. Um, and then uh, I can't remember who exactly it was that got me the audition on the 70s show, whether it was the manager or the agent. But but sh- yeah, shortly thereafter, I had that audition that, that was within probably being in town six months or something like that. So like I said, things kind of happened very quickly. And yeah, so I, I got the 70s show uh, audition. I had never seen the show. Um, and what did you play? Um, I was auditioning for Young Red. Uh, so you know, when the at the, at the time, you know, we had a fax machine. That's how you would get your uh, your side. So the the stuff started coming in. 
was like, I have no idea what the show is. I don't know who Red is, who is Young Red, and all this stuff. And then I um, uh, either I did the research or they told me that it was the younger version of this guy in the show, Kurtwood Smith, who plays the dad, Red uh, Foreman. And so I, once I knew that, I knew Kurtwood Smith from uh, Dead Poet Society and, uh, Robocop. and Robocop. And so I knew who that was. So I just thought, okay, I just have to do some sort of a – um, an imitation or something like that of of him. Um, I don't think they had, I'm trying to remember if they even had the scene written at the time or whether they, I think they actually auditioned me with actual red scenes from other episodes because they didn't have the uh, episode uh, that they were working on written yet. So I, I went in and, and read, uh, read Red's lines from uh, an older show, I guess. And uh, then I got called back and um, I was... Uh, Petrified. Uh, well, what, what was that callback experience like? Well, it's it's. Uh, I, I think of it like being shot out of a cannon. You know, it's it's a it's a high pressure sort of situation where you're you know you're kind of like lining up on the gangplank uh, in this narrow hallway with all these other guys who are vying for the same part. And I I honestly thought that I was. Uh, screwed right off the bat because one of the guys I was competing with for the part was in Dead Poet Society with Kurtwood. He played one of the major roles in the movie and had red hair. So I was <laughs> like, well, I don't even know why I'm here. He already knows the guy and uh, he already looks the part. So I, I thought this was just a waste of, waste of time. So you're lining up with all these, all these guys and you, you just... You know, you just one after another, they go in and they leave, they go in and, leave, and you just get closer and closer and closer. And then you go into the room and it's just this wall of people and everybody's very friendly because they want to put you at ease, but it doesn't really help that much because you're just so nervous. And, uh, it was a small room, just all of these eyes, all of these faces. And, uh, I just, uh, uh did what I did in the audition and left and just thought, well, that was a nice experience, but you know, I, I was fully convinced that there was no way that I, that, that I got it. Um, I was, like I said, I was very nervous. I don't know if that, if that came through or whether I was just able to mask it, but, uh, but yeah, and then I got the call that I, uh, got the part. So I was obviously quite elated. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to have to hear, uh, some of these, some of this, uh, red foreman <laughs> lines. Well, uh, I, I'm trying to remember, uh, well, obviously, his, even his catchphrase well, his, would be fine. Dumbass. <laughs> That's sort of his, uh, his 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 big line. Um, I just don't want to wear my ass for a hat. Dumbass. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. I would uh, like I to get the. This morning, I'm sounding pretty gravelly, but at the time, this was you know 17 years ago. I uh, just remember drinking a lot of coffee and smoking cigarettes outside my trailer <laughs> in order to. Uh, Affect the uh, effect of the voice. Get it down there. Yeah, get it down there. Isn't it funny though? Kurtwood Smith and and I mean, Dead Poets Society he was great, but in RoboCop he played a a really, really, really bad person who killed a lot of people. Like, oh yeah, no, he's a heavy. I, he was a very uh, intimidating um, presence. Uh, in Dead Poets Society, he was just such a hard ass, such a uh, you know, a rough, rough guy, and. Uh, so yeah, I was w once, you know, you go through the whole process of the agony of the auditioning and the callback and all of this stuff, and then you finally get it, and it's like, well, <laughs> it's almost like, oh, great, now I got it, now I actually have to show up and do this, you all know, right. it's like, um, so I was pretty intimidated to meet him um, and to do a, a bad impression of him in right. front of him, and he just, he's the nicest guy alive, it, couldn't have been sweeter he's the opposite of all of the parts that he plays he's just a very warm sweet person and and uh he couldn't have cared less that i was you know doing some sort of half-ass impression of him it, it just <laughs> well, it must, very... have, must have been your whole ass because you booked it so that's good yeah well i mean it was like i said it was just a couple lines i think and i just had to sort of you know just do that thing you know so uh, so i'm going to cut you off here because i'm going to hmm. make i'm going to make a prediction now so obviously you booked this, you're well on your way to stardom. You probably booked like four or five things in that year. The year after that, you book even more because that's how Hollywood works. You get here, right. you book one thing, and then you, it's guaranteed. Right. Is, yeah. am, I, am I right? Oh, yeah. There, I just, on the way here, just droves of buses just unloading 
kids from Idaho who uh, who were, were just in Bye Bye Birdie, you know, and all of their guidance counselors said, uh, "You should, uh, you got a nice face. You should uh, go to Holland." Yeah. Yeah, and that's how it works. You just uh, get off the bus. So tell me about all the bookings you had after that 70s show. Um, let me see. Oh, that would be none. <laughs> I uh, I did not work. I did I did two episodes of uh, of that show, and I did not work again for seven years. Seven seven years. years. And in that time, I barely had auditions. Um, and yeah, I did not work again for seven years i want to say it one more time just so you get it seven years seven years no acting work whatsoever. no acting work yet you still seven stuck years. seven years 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 <laughs> uh yeah and the, the funny thing was when i left um when i left ohio university the uh head of the school of theater uh who i had done some shows with uh, he was uh, directed me in some shows um very smart um experienced guy and I was doing my sort of farewell tour uh, you know just saying bye to everybody before I left and went to his office and and he said uh, well he said two things to me I I won't say the one uh, (laughs) because it involves people Um, uh, but he uh, the other thing that he said was uh, be prepared that you're not going to work for seven years (laughs) <laughs> he said that. Yes, he said that to me. He said, uh, "Just so you know, when you, you when you get there, you're not going to work for seven years." He was right, but wrong. Yeah, I mean, and and of course, at the time when I was uh, listening to him, I thought, "Well, yeah, I mean, that's other people, but you know, not me, not me. I mean, seven years, that's other people, but uh, you know, I'm special, you know." <laughs> I, I'll, you know, that's, I was, that's not going to be the case. You were in Bye Bye Birdie. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I I didn't have unrealistic expectations. I didn't think I was going to show up and have the red carpet rolled out for me. But I did, uh, after uh, having things fall into place, I assumed that th- things were going to continue in that sort of stepwise progression. I thought that... Um, it made sense the way everything worked out. Yeah, it sort, it sort of happened quickly, but it also didn't feel too outlandish. I mean, it was a, it was a, you know, it was a small thing, a small part. But th- and I and, and I just thought that I was maybe going to get another little guest star, maybe six months from now, and then maybe another one, and then just sort of build and get you know uh, build up the resume and and get more of these little things, and eventually start. And that just did not happen. It uh, it just the whole thing just fell apart. Um, so and seven years is a long time. Yes. So let's talk about what you did in those seven years to stay afloat. Oh, I uh, I um, hid all the razor blades and drank. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That's what I do every day too. <laughs> in that order. Oh. It's very important to hide the razor blades <laughs> before you start drinking. <laughs> Especially uh, in this town. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, practically, what I did was I worked um you know your 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 bad day jobs and um tried every day to figure out a way to get out of the um hole that just got deeper as the days went by um so tell us about these day jobs so i uh the first job that i had when i moved to town a friend of mine from uh ou had moved out uh, right before and so he got me a job uh at the juice bar at gold's gym hollywood um which for those of you at home is a notoriously uh gay gym it's uh, i think notoriously gay is the appropriate <laughs> phrase yes it is notoriously gay <laughs> to the point where when, they when warned the, you right yes yes <laughs> they uh, when I, I was i was warned uh when i uh, uh during the interview that uh to be prepared for um, I guess uh, to be hit on, I, I can't remember what it was. It was just, it, they were just warning me that it was gay. And I was like, I, I don't care. I don't have a, any issues with that. And I said, I'm a th- I was a theater major. And, and they said, no, you don't understand. This is, <laughs> this is a whole other level. And, and uh, when I first got here, I was looking for, I lived on Coanga and I was looking for a gym to work out at. And I was like, oh, Gold's Gym, 29 bucks a month. That's a solid deal. And my buddy was like, no. Yeah. Nope, don't do it. I'm like, why? And it's and again, I, I obviously this I don't have an issue with any of this stuff. I'm not, you know, but it was uh, 
you know, um, if you're not uh, prepared for certain things happening, uh, it could be a little shocking to you. And I, you know, <laughs> the the the, uh, the members, uh, some of them were very. Uh, forthright with their intentions. Um, so it was an interesting experience. Um, Not only that, you're a master linguist. You know that you, <laughs> you got that sentence out without sounding bad. I yeah. loved it. And uh, I also worked at a coffee shop uh, around the corner from my uh, first uh, house that I lived in, um, right by the House of Pies there on uh, Vermont and Franklin. Uh, so it was a coffee shop. It was called Psychobabble at the time. I think it's called <laughs> Brew now. But uh, I was a barista in in uh, high school, and so I thought uh, I, you know, I could probably get a job at a coffee place, and it was convenient because it was uh, close to my place. Um, but yeah, the, the the one thing I remember most about um, working at the at the coffee shop was that. Um, so when I did the '70s show, it was just obviously this great experience where you know I went to the taping. Uh, my stuff was pre-shot, so. Um, uh, I didn't. I didn't actually perform with the cast in front of the uh, audience, but they showed my scenes on the screen and they captured the uh, reaction from the audience. But I went to the taping, and it was just great. It was just so much fun, you know. Um, get to uh, experience that moment. I did a curtain call with the cast and just had this great high of a of an evening. And uh, you know, up to that point, probably the best night of my life. And. I just remember the uh, the next day, I had to set my alarm for 4:30, and uh, walk across the street to unlock the doors at Psycho Babble <laughs> and start making the coffee. And the feeling, the soul crushing feeling of that morning was unlike anything I had prepared myself for or could have prepared myself for. It was, I was so shocked at the pain <laughs> of what that felt like uh, to have that great evening the night before and then just get flushed through the toilet of life back into your <laughs> terrible, terrible existence once again. It was just the, it was a night and day yin yang smack in the face of, of awfulness. That, that was a very, very uh, rough morning uh, to go back to that. I met Kurtwood Smith yesterday. Sure you did. Get me a cappuccino, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's exactly it. You just, it, yeah, as you're, as you're like you're making these lattes, you kind of want to go like, last night, I was on the 70s show last night. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. It's I just mean, such a rude awakening. And just to be clear to any of our barista listeners, he's not talking crap about your profession. He just wants to be a, oh, a well, star. Oh, well, it's... Well, I don't want to be a star. I just wanted to work. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, that's all I really want to do. But it was... Look, there's nothing uh, wrong with barista making is not a life choice. <laughs> All right, <laughs> tell that it to is, the Starbucks. Employee. It is a stepping stone. Hopefully, you know these are not meant to sustain grown adults f- through their life. So I was well aware of that. Fair enough. Uh, that's a phenomenal story. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'll I will never ever forget that. Just uh, the the two feelings of one the just the abject pain and then just that I did not see that coming a mile away. I thought, oh, I'm just going to wake up and I'll, it'll be fine. I was like, oh my God, this feels terrible. <laughs> this is so bad. No, should have taken the day off. Oh, I, I should have taken the day off, but I needed money, you know, I needed yeah. to work. Uh, and well, then you did keep working. You got a job at the pig. I did. BBQ uh, joint. Yeah. I, uh, I went from those, uh, the gold's gym, uh, and, uh, the coffee shop, job into a job at a barbecue restaurant called The Pig. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's there on, uh, on La Brea, um, uh, right beneath the, uh, very close to the, the, the famous Tommy Wiseau, uh, The Room billboard. I used to drive by it every day thinking, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Um, How long till you saw The Room? Uh, probably 10 years. <laughs> I had no idea. Like it, uh, I, I, it took me reading an article in LA Weekly about that the, they were doing like midnight screenings of this thing. And I was like, that's the billboard. I remember that. That's what this is. And so at that point, I was like, I got to see this thing. But uh, yeah, I just remember seeing that every day. But uh, yeah, so I worked at the barbecue restaurant for about four years. Um, and uh, and yeah, and uh, like I said, was not was not working uh, as an actor. Uh, but still auditioning this whole time, still keeping up your craft. I mean 
trying to. I just didn't have any opportunities. I really didn't have proper representation at the time. I had uh, a friend of mine um, who's an actress. Uh, actually, she's uh, a few guys have seen Three Billboards. Mm-hmm. She's uh, plays Sam Rockwell's mom, uh, Sandy Martin. Oh, she's also she was in. Uh, Napoleon's grandma. Yeah. And, so she's she was uh, an acting teacher of mine, and uh, um, and she also managed some some uh, talent that she wanted to she's help She's an acting teacher? This is the woman that's always sunny. Yeah. Max mom. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, she coaches, teaches, and... Uh, I just want to go take a class from her just so I can hang out with her. Oh, I mean, she's phenomenal. She's, just, she's so great. She's she's so, this. Yeah, I met her. She came into audition here. Oh, really? And we talked about Always Sunny because I'm a super fan. I've seen yeah. every episode at least 15 times. And so we were talking about it. And her voice was different. And I told her, I was like, oh, my God, your voice is so different than what I expected. Cause she sounds like a normal woman. Yeah. And then she just turned on the eh, yeah, yeah, voice like yeah, that, and yeah. it blew my mind. Yeah. It was incredible. So does she not smoke cigarettes in real life? Uh, not anymore. I believe she's off the uh, off the cigarettes at this point. Um, uh, she's, she's good. She but yeah, is, she's, uh, she's she was a she's a great person. She's a good friend of mine, and um, but she was nice enough to you know send me out on some auditions here and there. But I did not have that many opportunities at the time, so I was I was trying everything I could do to find those opportunities. And uh, for me, that was scouring Craigslist for uh, people posting for acting jobs, uh, you know, getting backstage West and, you know, sending your, uh, you know, headshot in uh, the old fashioned way, snail mail, trying to get representation, all of this stuff. I was trying. Um, And I was, you know, taking class with Sandy and um, other classes. And uh, so I was trying, but I just, but I think that's important. You're keeping up your craft. You're not just sitting around bartending, no, I mean, partying, doing whatever. You're actually still acting in these seven years, even though you weren't well, I, I, booking. Yeah, I mean, I was I was doing some scene work in, in class and stuff. Um, Don't say it like that. You were doing some fucking scene work. Yeah, I was I working mean, on it. I, th- I think more important... Uh, look, uh, I, I think the most important thing is just putting one foot in front of the other and trying everything that you can. As far as, like... I, I, I have a whole jag about um, classes, which is an unpopular uh, <laughs> opinion. But um, I was taking classes at the time because, one, I liked Sandy, and two, it was better than doing nothing. And three, it was uh, an opportunity to get in front of people because they were like scene showcases and stuff. So I went to school for... For acting, I, I got I got a theater degree. I studied it, and um, not that that makes you an expert or that you're done with your education, but I felt like I did have a little bit of a leg up on a lot of people that are here in town who have never uh, taken an acting class or maybe just taken a few when they when they arrived in town. I had an education in in theater and. Uh, this town likes to um, uh, uh, have this this idea for actors that you have to be in a constant state of of uh, classes and all this stuff. Now that's fine for some people. I think a lot of people get a lot of benefit out of it, especially people who have not taken any classes before. But I don't like this idea where if you if who, who are you studying with and you say I'm not I'm not taking classes they look at you like you're not doing what you should be doing. It's different for everybody. I'm not a big class guy. I don't really like that experience that much. And I feel and and, and here's the other thing. It, by the way, it's the it's the only one. All right, I'm gonna go all over the place. The they this attitude is. Uh, primarily to bilk uh, actors without any money from their money. Uh-huh. They, they, they tell you, oh, you got you to take this class, you got to take this class, you got to get these headshots. This town is just sucking dry uh, the wallets of actors who do not have any money in said wallet. So I, I, I object to that. Um, and like I said, you know, if you want to take them, fine. But don't look askance at me if, if I'm not in a class at that time. And the other thing that no... Uh, when I, it's the only... <laughs> I was going to say this before. It's the only profession where uh, it's assumed that you have to be in a constant state of classes. If I'm a songwriter, I'm a piano player. I haven't taken a piano lesson in 
30 years, 30 years, 20 years, something like that. It's been a long time. I know how to play the piano. Does that mean that I can't get better? No. Does that mean that I don't try to uh, uh, educate myself by listening to things and trying new music? Of course, you do this on your own. But when you get to a certain point, you sort of move on. You're, mm-hmm. you're done with the piano lessons. You've, you've learned how to read music, and you know how to sort of take what you have learned and continue learning on your own, okay? I, um, nobody says to you, w- w- uh, w- what songwriting classes have you taken lately? Well, I'm not taking songwriting classes. It's, it's, so I really object to this idea of you can't be an actor unless you're in, in a constant state of coaching in, 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 in classes. That's it's silly. And my final point on this jag is uh, it's especially stupid because the parts that these people are um, going in for, the... the, the roles that we have the opportunities to play at a certain level do not require a constant state of classes. It doesn't require anything. If you are lucky enough to be an auditioning actor, you're going out for ambulance driver number three on a procedural and your line is going to be, ma'am, are you okay? You don't need (laughs) the Stanislavski method for that, okay? Mm -hmm. We do these we, we don't need to be we're, we're far over educated for the roles that we are given the opportunity for for the for the most part so it's like well, well you have to be in class what so i can so when i go in for the ambulance driver number three i'm gonna it's silly it's silly so anyway that's my jag about classes. so do me a favor tell me how you really feel yeah <laughs> i just i just think and it's the other thing like you're you know you're you the whole commercial thing where, oh, who do you uh, uh, do uh, improv with? I want to see improv on your resume. It's like, I finally just took a UCB class so I didn't have to lie about it on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just tired of hearing it and tired of feeling like guilty for her. So finally I can just say yes. But did I, now when I'm in the room and they, you know, and I'm improvising and they, they're laughing, they say, oh, well, well, you're, you're, you're good, you're funny, and we see that you went to UCB, so that makes a lot of sense. It has nothing to do with it. It has <laughs> right. nothing to do with it. I didn't, and I'm not, again, I'm not slighting UCB or improv classes or taking classes or any of that, but the skills that I use in the room, I was using before, and mm-hmm. I still use, and I had, had nothing to do with that, you know. Well, we've been sidetracked. I'm sorry. We've got to get back on it. I just Why did you get it. me talking about classes? I didn't. That's all good <laughs> it's, stuff, it's, by the way, because... Yeah. I agree with all that stuff. Yeah, it's just there are there are more ways than one to skin a cat, and so if is if I show up and I'm able to pull off, you know, man number three, don't tell me I have to take a class. <laughs> right. There are seven ways, listeners. Yeah, seven, seven ways. There's exactly it's seven ways. I, I, one I, for every year. I did not work. <laughs> I, I do agree with all of that. That everyone is different because some people love that stuff. Yeah. I personally like performing with my improv troupe that's, that's, and that's, that's like my class that's your like, deal. it's yeah. fun I have a good time and right. I think it helps me perform because when I'm taking risks on stage and doing these big bold characters and when I come to a room to audition it's like no nah, I just did a gay German tourist the other night on stage in front of 50 people I can exactly say ma'am are you okay exactly and that's, <laughs> and that's, and that's great I did a great gay yeah, German I did a tourist fantastic. it was very very messy. useful in the commercial uh, oh hello Olaf yes. <laughs> but uh, let's move on so you kept uh, you still had to keep working and uh, you got a job at Tutti Fruity yeah, eventually. Um, Tutti Fruity Farms? Uh, Tutti Fruity Farms. Yeah, eventually uh, I, I wound up there. Um, after The Pig, I started teaching um, music in uh, uh, an academy in Monrovia. I taught piano, guitar, trumpet, singing, songwriting, a little math. Um, and uh, I did that for a couple years. And then I um, uh, played and sang in, in bars and restaurants, doing cover tunes. That was a... That was a, a fun uh, job, and then an actor buddy of mine, um, uh, who would, uh, had been working for this organic farm, uh, said, "Hey, if you're looking for some extra money, this is a good gig and low pressure uh, sort of situation." So I started working for uh, yeah an organic farmer called Tutti Fruity Farms. They've been uh, been around for well, about thirty years, family owned uh, farm, and uh, yeah, so I worked the Hollywood. Uh, farmers market and the Santa Monica farmers market. And Did you have to sell to the customers? Oh yes, yes. Uh, so that's the thing is like the kicker was after the exhaustion of setting the whole thing up. That's just the first <laughs> bit of the day. The rest of the day is you 
uh, selling uh, vegetables. Um, and uh, we had some interesting characters. Um, every, everything uh, from celebrities to uh, elderly Russian hags and everybody in between. Uh, but uh, yeah, lots of lots of crazy old Russian women out there who just want to, you know, get you to charge them five cents less for their turnips. It's really <laughs> it's really crazy. Do you know um, how many turnips they eat? <laughs> they're oh, oh, they're yes. saving dollars. No, I know, I know. They they're they're feeding villages uh, apparently. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there, for some for some reason the just the old Russian women are just kind of unpleasant and uh, yeah. So uh, somebody ex- explained it to me or tried to tell me that well, this is what it's like in their country. This is this is what they're used to. It's like they haven't lived there in thirty years. <laughs> they're here now. Okay, they don't have to be mean. They don't have to bargain. You're already getting a great deal on delicious organic produce. Why, you know? <laughs> so. I like how you're still repping yeah, tutti frutti. Kidding. We're looking for sponsors. Well, delicious yeah. organic produce. Yeah. The I mean, fuel. It just always flabbergasted me that that you're. I would already round everything down, and and then they would still want like oh, for me. You give deal for me. <laughs> you deal for me. And they would they would go around and they would pick up the 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 shit that hit the floor. And now I understand that some of these folks are are poor, and and I'm, and you got to do everything that you can. And I'm not, you know, um, I'm not coming down on that at all. Whatever you can do, I get it. But but they would just insist that they were allowed free things like they are they are smashed for me. You give, and they we they they would come around the back of the truck. These old women would come around the back of the truck and start rooting in the truck. <laughs> and we would, we would turn around because we were helping people. We would turn around and there'd be this, you'd see this hump. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's, it's Helga in the back and she's rooting through. And we would have to go and get out of here. It was like shooing pigeons. You know, we, I mean, I've thrown rotten vegetables at elderly women. <laughs> This is what the job reduced me to. It got f- so frustrating that, yeah, I... Uh, I'm just picturing a young red. Hucking yeah. tomatoes. That's what Dumb it was ass. like. Dumb ass. That's what it was like. No, I used to... I, Did you ever have any other, like, do you have any verbal confrontations with them? I, uh, frequently. Frequently. Um, it, and it, it's not just me. There, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story in a moment, but it's not just me. There, there's, a, there's a guy that works there that is a yoga instructor. <laughs> and he is all uh, namaste and all of his, uh, you know, we would see his students come up and they'd be, oh, um, I'm not going to say his name, but they, uh, oh, we'll call him Phil. His name isn't Phil. Be, oh, Phil, so nice to see you. Can't wait to see you in class. And he would bow and say namaste. Very peaceful and just realize that this is, what, and then he would go, get the, get the fuck out of here, lady. <laughs> he was from Rhode Island. He was like, get, get out of here. He would lose his mind. Sorry, I, Sorry, I clipped. But he he would go from... Do I do it again? Get out of here, lady! Get the fuck out of here, okay? He would go from being very calm and collected and namaste to turning on a dime and screaming at these women because <laughs> even he, a yogi, was reduced to this. Uh, it, it, was, it was so bad. I, I go back to visit uh, frequently to see my old boss and to get some vegetables. And I had been away from the job it's been probably several years since I've I've worked there, and I'm a pretty collected, even keel guy. I haven't really lost my temper. I don't think in since I had worked there, really. And I'm back there. I'm just talking to my boss. I'm picking out some tomatoes. I'm on the other side of the, you know, I'm on the customer side, and my boss is helping people as she's talking to me, and we're catching up. And and sure as shit, I. Within five minutes of being there, old Russian lady trying to bargain my boss down for five cents, and she just starts, oh, and she won't give up. Oh, please, for me, you give it. And I lost it. I lost it in, in, in line as a customer. I started screaming at this woman. It's like, get out of here. What are you doing? I will this, throw this at your babushka. I swear to God. Lady. What are you trying to do? This is a, a family-run business. Is, you're already getting a great deal. So I lost. I lost it. Yeah. Yeah. I would frequently. Uh, I would frequently yell at customers, and it was nice because my boss didn't care. 
she um, she just uh, she would just smile and say yeah yeah. And then came the day where you sold your last bit of Tutti Frutti Farms. <laughs> yeah, you, it, that's you one got of those a job on a show. That's one of those jobs where you always sort of have one foot in because you never know when you're going to have to go back. You know, so I kept doing that after I started booking commercials and stuff. Um, I still kept the job, thinking like any day, and I still feel that way. I could I could be working there tomorrow. I mean. Um, I always have one foot in the tutti frutti door just to make sure. Um, but yeah, I, what got me out of the, uh, the, uh, seven years in, in the wilderness, um, I ended up finding a film on Craigslist and it was not, um, uh, an X rated film. <laughs> it was not me, uh, giving massages, uh, to uh, somebody as they filmed it, uh, wearing a diaper. It was uh, it was a, a, a science fiction film and uh, a, a, an adaptation of a Ray Bradbury story. And so, uh, once they offered me the part, I had to decide whether I wanted to um, get out of the uh, union because it was it was non-union. So the way it works is you can either, you know, you can do it and hope that nobody catches you. Uh, which feels, I know a lot of people do and I don't judge. It just, it didn't feel right to me personally. I wanted to sort of do everything by the book and be honest about it. And so that option was uh, what they call um, financial core, which is this strange loophole in the SAG bylaws where you become a fee-paying non-member. Um, you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to cut up your card you know, and you have to go through this whole witchcraft ceremony and light it on fire and send up a smoke signal. This, there's this whole procedure. Uh, but you, uh, by doing that, you're allowed to work non-union, and, but you can also still work union. So that's what I did in order to, um, to do this film. I thought that I was screwing myself. I thought that it was a bad move overall in the long run because I was so lucky to get taft Hartley'd for that 70s show, meaning I didn't have to go through a lot of the rigmarole of getting your, uh, your, your vouchers for extra work and all this stuff. I was lucky enough that I got just, you know, fast-tracked uh, taft Hartlead into SAG for uh, the 70s show. And I was like, ah, I'm so lucky and fortunate to ha- have this happen. And I thought, now I'm just throwing this all away um, in order to do this movie, but I had no other choice because I had no other opportunities. I had not worked in seven years and I wanted to do this film. And so I went FICOR, um, and, uh, and yeah, and it turned out to be, uh, for me, a good decision because I ended up subsequently started clawing my way back doing non-union work, commercials and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and this was no small film. It was a Ray Bradbury film. It was a small film, but it was a uh, it was a. Well, at the time, it felt it, big for me. Yeah, no, I was just happy. I I was just happy to do a movie. It was my first movie, um, and I loved uh, Ray Bradbury as a kid. Uh, is one of my favorite authors, and um, yeah. So just and sci fi is one of my favorite genres. So the whole thing was just a great deal. Okay. Did you get to meet Ray Bradbury? I did. That was the that was the. He awakes. He's awake now. Yeah. Producer Will's back yeah, in. Yeah. Ray Bradbury. All I have Kirk to do is see Ray, Bra- Ray Bradbury. Um, I've, I've been awake the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. When I got the, when I got the movie, I sort of thought to myself, "Man, if I'm lucky enough, oh, it's my stomach growling. Sorry. If I'm lucky enough, maybe I'll get to meet him. Not thinking that I, I would. I mean, what? Just because it, we're doing an adaptation of his book, that doesn't mean anything. And I got to I got to meet him several times. Got to hang out with him and talk with him and it was just uh, well I called that movie the gift that uh, kept giving because it was it was a great experience to do the movie to begin with but then to get to meet one of your childhood you know hero authors and um that was just it was it was great and and I met um several of my best friends today on that movie um and it was uh on that film that talking to the other actors they said, oh, I, how did you get this? Did your agent submit? Yeah, I was like, I don't have an agent. They said, oh, <laughs> did, you, uh, did you do Actors Access? That's how we got it. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, I got this through Craigslist. And they were like, what? I was like, yeah, it was, I found this on Craigslist. And they were 
you know, flabbergasted. And they said, no, 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 you, you need to, if you're not doing this already, you need to start submitting yourself. Um, if you don't have an agent, submit yourself on Actors Access and LA Casting and all these things that I had never heard of. And so once they told me that that was an option, literally the next day, I started doing that. And um, it's still part of my little um, procedure every day. I get up, I uh, have coffee, and I submit to about five different sites. And it was in doing that, those self-submissions, that I was able to pull myself back into the world um, of, uh, of doing, doing work. You know, I submit myself to commercials, and I just started booking commercials that way. And that is a bunch of work. That's every morning to wake up to look at those and scan through those takes forever. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It takes it takes hours. Um, but it's only because of that that I am able to work. I mean, uh, all of the big. I mean, I would say ninety six percent of the work that I have ever gotten, I have gotten myself, and I've negotiated myself without the assistance of representation. Negotiated yourself. Yeah, because uh, um, my uh, commercial agent did not want to handle non-union stuff. And uh, even if I brought them a, uh, a a campaign that I had gotten myself and I asked them, would you negotiate this for me and take uh, you can take a percentage, they wouldn't handle it. So I had to do it myself. And so I had learned a little bit over the years watching when I had, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm, man, <laughs> what's going on over puberty there? is rough. <laughs> Sounds like Sorry. it. It was a late night last night. Um, I had learned a little bit over the years watching my manager uh, negotiate and she would, you know, say like, don't, you know, make sure you don't do this and do this. And so I got a, you know, a few pointers over the years and then I, it, it just was trial by fire. I just had, I had to start negotiating myself because I had no other choice. I did not have a manager at that time and my agent would not do it. So I just started doing it. And it's um, it's a, a frustrating um, hat to have to wear, but ultimately it's a good one um, because a lot of actors uh, just are willfully um, ignorant about that because, well, they generally don't have to deal with it. And the thing is, it behooves you to pay attention to everything because um, this town and this industry, like I mentioned before, is out to take everything from you. They're out to take your money. They're out to take advantage of you. Uh, that's just the way it goes. And so when you go to a set, you, you can't uh, uh, assume that you are safe. You have to look around and take precautions and in the same way when you get a contract you have to pay attention to it and you have to be smart and assume that they're trying to screw you because they are the production companies uh, parallel quite nicely with the little Russian ladies. You, you, yes, you take absolutely. acting contracts. Five me, cents for this. You me. take maybe contract you take, for maybe me. Maybe you take uh, less money. Please. You do commercial for, for me. me. For me, you give. You give. Get out of here, lady. Get out of here. <laughs> Can't throw rotten tomatoes at them, though. No, I wish, though. I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's an, it's, it's, it was a reluctant position to, to, to be in, and you know, a, an unfun skill to have to flex, but ultimately. A good one. I feel uh, much uh, sharper and stronger uh, being aware of everything, and it's something that I encourage everybody to just uh, uh, pay attention to because um, being informed and being sharp and being aware uh, gives you strength. And as actors uh, who are, you know, most of us are every day trying to find work. Um, and it's hard. So any little bit of strength that you can garner for yourself is important because we are constantly in a position of, of weakness. Um, we are uh, a dime a dozen, and uh, we are made to feel that way, and we constantly show up hat in hand. We feel like, oh, please, please, please give me the job. you know. Uh, and so we're already behind the eight ball, um, with the sort of psychic burden that we carry around with ourselves because we're in that position. And so any little bit of strength 
uh, uh, helps. And w- what you take from that is next time you're in a negotiation situation or next time you're even in a, in a room uh, auditioning, you arm yourself and you slowly, what I sort of think of it as is like building this suit of armor up. Every little victory that you have, whether that's, um, you know, telling somebody to fuck off that needed to fuck off or catching something or, you know, any little victory, you just add a little bit of armor to yourself and eventually you become bulletproof. And eventually you can walk into a room and nothing phases you and you can, you, you know, uh, you can take somebody down if they, if they need to. Not to be disrespectful to people, but you you understand your position a little bit more. You you own your strength a little bit more. So I think that's important for a lot of actors to remember. And then, my friend, <laughs> one of your greatest accomplishments as an actor, mm. you booked the fantastic film in 2010, <laughs> the college stoner classic. <laughs> every every. Frat boy across the country knows you for your role. Yes. In Dino Croc and Super Gator. Dino Croc versus Super Gator, yes. Uh, One of the better ones, I will say. Yeah, I mean, uh, the audience was clamoring for those uh, creatures to go head to head, and finally they got their <laughs> wish in Dino Croc versus Super Gator. You've seen Dino Croc, you've seen Super Gator, and you've seen them together in Dino Croc versus Super Gator. Yeah. <laughs> It was, um, that was uh, a Roger Corman uh, film um, that was directed by a guy named Jim Wynorski, who's done tons of films, uh, including uh, Chopping Mall, if you know that 80s slasher classic. Uh, and I think he did uh, Return of Swamp Thing with uh, Heather Locklear. Um, but he, uh, he's done a lot of uh, Roger Corman's movies, and I've been in a bunch of Jim's uh, movies produced by Roger Corman, so it was, it was really cool to be a, a kind of ushered into the Roger Corman family because he's, uh, f- f- I say that sort of film family because he's got such a rich history of uh, working with people and giving people their their star. You know, he started off uh, Nicholson, um, Scorsese, Coppola. Uh, I think he gave uh, Ron Howard his first directing job. Um, so that was cool to know that oh, I can check that off the box. I've, I've done a Roger Corman movie, you know. So it was fun. We, uh, we shot that in, uh, in Hawaii. Um, that was David Carradine's last movie. Um, David Carradine of Kill Bill, volume correct. two. yes. Uh, Carradine uh, was shot out in L.A., and then uh, we, we went to uh, Kauai to, uh, you know, continue filming. So he was done. He was back in L.A. or whatever, traveling, we thought. And um, so uh, I'm eating my oatmeal on uh, getting ready to go to set uh, in, in Hawaii, shooting Dino Croc vs. Super Gator, the film that Carradine had just shot his scenes for a couple days ago. Look up on the television in the hotel. David Carradine found dead in a Thailand hotel wearing women's clothing. <laughs> So he went, he, he, either he was so despondent that he was in Dino Croc versus Super Gator <laughs> or something terrible happened. But either way, uh, he finished that movie and then uh, was uh, dead very shortly thereafter before we even finished the film. So were people on set worried about that? Like, eh. uh, the show must go on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, on, principal, on principal Roger, filming has been completed, so I guess yeah. It's all right. I mean, on the, there, there, are, there's the the budget on those movies is uh, so low that I think it's actually uh, in the negatives. I think uh, I think one has to pay to be in them. That's how <laughs> the low the budget is. So uh, yeah, time is of the essence, and uh, everybody just kind of was like, oh, okay, and then we just kept kept filming. Hmm. Bring in the dino croc, boy. <laughs> That's right. Bring in, the <laughs> bring in the stunt croc. Yes. Um, also, I've been to Thailand. Uh, it's not weird. To have <laughs> not at all. On. <laughs> I just got back from there, actually. Did you? Yeah. Where'd you go, Krabi? We went to Bangkok, uh, uh, Chiang Mai, and Phuket. I went to Bangkok. Nice. But not Phuket or Chiang Mai. Yeah. I went to the other side. I went to Krabi. Yeah. That's why I said Karabi. Did you like it? I loved it. Yeah, I would like to go back, and I guess I'll have to go to Karabi. You should. Go to Koh Samui. Koh Samui? I went there because of Meet the Fockers. Okay. 
right. <laughs> so I was like, well, I got to go to Koh Samui because okay. I'd never heard of it before. Yeah. Operation Koh Samui. Jack Talk Time. Jack Talk Time. <laughs> Very well. Um, yeah, I managed to uh, escape uh, without hanging myself in a closet. So In women's clothes. In women's clothes, yeah. It's fantastic. But you did put on women's clothes. Oh, yeah, I want to give it. Styling. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And then uh, let's get caught up on current day because I actually watch these. And if I didn't know you, I would buy Overstock.com because <laughs> your spokesmending in that is fantastic. Thank the you. walk and talk, the sit, it's all very natural. Thank you. Um, for those of you listening, anything with Overstock, he's wearing a red tie, gray suit, walking around, talking to you right to your camera. Makes you feel like you want to buy something. That's right. With that delicious chalupa voice of his, <laughs> Taco Bell chalupa voice that that uh, is is cracking all over the place this morning. Yeah, what's that? The the chalupa voice that's cracking all over the place this morning. That's okay. It's because yeah. you had a late night eating chalupas. Yeah. Uh, what what was that audition process like? What's it like to film those? Um, Overstock actually um, was one of the easy ones because I didn't audition for that at least in person. Um, I sent a really kind of half-ass uh, self-tape in. Um, uh, I think, though, uh, that that happened because I, at that point, which is, this has been like a year ago when I got it, I've amassed a lengthy spokesperson reel. So it's it's sort of out. Who, who, what have all of you been spokesmen for? Um, I started off, my first commercial was a spokesperson for Trusted ID, um, and then I did uh, a campaign for Papa Murphy's Pizza for two years, and then I did uh, Taco John's for two years, then I did Five Hour Energy for two years, and then Overstock, and in between all of these little one-offs of tons of other stuff so I anyway to, to answer your question I think the reason why the audition process was like it was is because they had probably seen stuff and just knew that I could look at the camera and speak you know <laughs> and I could do what they, they wanted to but uh, but yeah I mean the, the spokesperson jobs are um, my bread and butter uh, they're the jobs that I tend to get the most of whether it's actual spokesperson stuff or like hosting you know and talking to the camera there are uh, deceptively difficult. Um, there are some things that people look at and go, well, that seems like it's pretty difficult that are actually very easy. A lot of commercial jobs are very, very simple to the point where I often tell people you could probably just close your eyes and r pick a random homeless person and they could do what is required on set. Spokesperson stuff is, I find, very difficult. And um, it's just it just requires a lot of... Uh, focus and memory and um, energy and uh, it's, uh, it's it's one of those things that is I think far more difficult than it looks so when when if somebody like you which I appreciate sa says that it's natural and it comes off it's it just means that there's a lot of work going on there and that just means that I've done my job because obviously you don't want to see all the wheels turning but it's 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 difficult it, it is funny because when we do spokesman roles here at the studio I spend half the time getting actors that walk in to not do a voice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they walk in and they have it memorized, and it's like, hey, Overstock.com. No, no, just talk to me. Yeah, I just no, want you to I be know. you. Don't do anything more than that. Oh, yeah. And no, it's, it's, it's hard. This it is. is my natural voice. I'm no, it talking is. to you <laughs> right now. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes that actually works. I, I mean, I, I uh, was doing some, some job. I think it was for some sort of... Uh, European cell phone or something and I I started off at a certain level and they kept adjusting me up and I eventually got to the point where I said to myself I just have to do a bad impression of a spokesperson and that's what I did and that's what they wanted they loved it yeah <laughs> the whole time I was like I hate myself for doing this but it's exactly what they wanted so sometimes the, sometimes they want that voice for the, but for the most part what works is just talking naturally. I hate you know. myself for doing this. Now let me cash this check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you do feel like a colossal boner in the moment. <laughs> I mean, just. Well, I must be a spokesman because I feel like that 24-7. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a spokesman all day long. Um, fantastic. Okay, Corey. We're going to move on to the most difficult segment of the show. We call this segment Method Acting. Yeah. 
I'm going to give you a scenario, and you give me the line your character in this scenario would say. Okay. Think you can handle that? Um, I think so. I think so. Okay, here we go. Wow, well, a lot of build-up. You, just, you ruined my timing. I'm sorry. I didn't, know, that's, I didn't know that was what was happening there was timing. Okay. All right, sorry. All right. Here we go. Okay. You're at an audition, and an actor asks you which acting class you're in. <laughs> I don't need class, motherfucker. I went to school. Next scenario. Okay. A person cuts you off in traffic. They have an Iowa license plate and a bumper sticker that says, I was in Bye Bye Birdie. Go back home. We don't want you here. Stop <laughs> clogging the freeways. Leave now. It's fantastic. Our last one. You're making a fresh squeezed juice. <laughs> At Gold's gym. Mm. One of the gym members walks up and says, Can I have extra orange juice with your fine ass? And by orange juice, do you mean orange juice? No. I quit. And this has been Method Acting. Phenomenal answers. Um, I'm going to get you out here on the same question I ask every single one of my guests. What would Corey Landis now tell Corey Landis on I-70 going through Denver on his way to Los Angeles? That is a good question. I know. <laughs> um, I would say uh, don't worry and have more fun. That's good. Yeah. You worried a lot when you got here? I am in a constant state of worry uh, that I'm worry. dealing with uh, as the days go by, but w especially when I got here, I was absolutely uh, worried. Um, yeah. So looking back, I, I would, I w if I had to do it over, I would release myself of all of that, that angst and uh, allow myself to have a little bit more fun, uh, which I'm catching up with now in my advanced years. Trying to have a little bit more fun. Well, that's some fantastic words of wisdom. Corey, we're going to get you out of here on that. I want to send a massive thank you over to that side of the table. Thank you very much for thank being you. with us thank today. You, Corey. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for letting me just hear that fantastic voice in my ears for the last hour. It has been <laughs> like heaven on earth or Absolutely. like having a double-decker taco as well as three Doritos Locos Tacos. Taco Bell, need Ooh. the sponsor. Get that sponsor. Love that. Uh, also, thank you, Producer Will, taking such great notes today. You did a fantastic Ooh. job. Well done. Enjoying uh, his new microphone. He is. So nice. Nice it is. Also, I'm going to go ahead and sell myself. Great job, Robbie D. You were wonderful. Corey liked all your questions. And guys out there, don't forget to tune in next week. We have a fantastic guest, none other than Oscar-nominated actor Sam Rockwell will be Ooh, here. That's a good get. That's a great wow. get. Um, that may or may not be true. Only one way to find out is tune in next week. Thanks for listening to Robbie D. and the Lesser Knowns, and we'll see you next time. Robbie D. and the Lesser Knowns.